We're in your United States history book, chapter 16, session three, the union presses on to victory. The years are going to be 1863 to 1865. Um, in this video, we're gonna talk about um, the battles at Chattanooga and Chickamauga and on to um, Grant taking command, the Sherman marches, Grant's wilderness campaign, Surrender at Appomattox, where uh, Lee surrenders to Grant, the end of conflicts, and then a little um, on Christian generals during this time. You see here's Sherman marches to the sea, which are pretty much of a low point. This is a lot of looting um, by the uh, Union armies of the South. Um, actually a pretty sad part, I would think. And on to Appomattox here with um, General uh, Grant and Lee, General Grant, um, shaking hands, the end of the war. So let's begin. The Battles of Chattanooga and Chickamauga. So um, General Lee's defeat at Gettysburg. Remember, but Lee did um, retreat. And so um, he, again, that was not the end of the war at Gettysburg, but it was a turning point, that's for sure as the South um, had lost in Gettysburg. And it was only um, one day before Vicksburg also, where General Grant um, actually had Vicksburg surrender. Vicksburg being that, um, that fort that was um, supposedly insurpassable and Grant taking over the Mississippi River, which was another um, high point for General Grant. So Grant now moved into Tennessee and captured Chattanooga, which was an important railroad center. Um, so that was very important. So he captured Chattanooga, Tennessee. On September 1863, the Union Army led by William S. Rosecans, General Rosecans. And um, he forced out the Confederate general, which was General Braxton Bragg out of Chattanooga without even a battle. So Rosencrantz comes in, he's a Union general, and he comes in to attack um, Chattanooga, and Braxton Bragg is not ready for the attack, so he just surrenders. They don't even have a fight. He just totally surrenders Chattanooga at this time. So Rosencrantz, General Rosencrantz, um, the Union general, um, pursues Bragg into Georgia you know, pursues him. So it looks like, you know, he's following, pursuing him, thinking that um, um, he's actually able to overcome the, the Confederate um, soldiers and the Confederate General Bragg. So here's um, Rosencrantz, a picture of him here, and um, going on to pursue General Bragg. Here's a picture of, here's, here's a picture of, um, uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, and Chickamauga, which is in Georgia, right over. So here's how close they were. So these two um, towns will be taken over by the Union Army in the midst of this. It's a battle happens at this time, too. The Battle of Chickamauga. So um, General Bragg um, of the South received reinforcements all of a sudden in Chickamauga. So he turns, you know, he's retreating, and Rosencrantz is like... Um, chasing after him <laughs> and and so he turns around and he has reinforcements now and he uh, fires on the Union Army with General Rosencrantz. And so then General Rosencrantz is forced to retreat, but he is saved by his left wing general. So part of his command was under um, the command of George H. Thomas. And because of Thomas's bravery and standing up against Bragg, he's known as the Rock of Chickamauga. So the Rock of Chickamauga was um, the Union um, General Thomas standing up and um, basically taking command at this point. And um, um, Rosencrantz took refuge in Chattanooga and Thomas took over Chickamauga. So, so just remember, Chickamauga and Chattanooga. Two towns, one's in Georgia and one's in uh, Tennessee here. So here we have a picture of what's going on here, the Rock of Chickamauga. <laughs> so 
the Battle of Chattanooga, Chattanooga, Chattanooga Tennessee. Again, remember, um, Rosencrantz went into Chattanooga and he basically took over Chattanooga without even um, firing a shot at all. So now they're back at Chattanooga and of course Rosencrantz there and Confederate Bragg now is laying siege to the city from the Lookout Mountain south of the city to uh, attack Rosencrantz in Chattanooga. So it basically it just turns from the, from the, the south, from under um, Bragg and now to Rosencrantz and now Rosencrantz in Chattanooga. <laughs> Opposite. And so the Union is in a very desperate position at this time and figuring that um, here comes Bragg and he's going to take over um, Chattanooga again. It has already fell to the Union, but now he's going to get it back. But in the nick of time, here comes General Grant uh, arriving there from Vicksburg. So a bloody battle begins. A relentless three-day attack happens in Chattanooga on November 1863. And the, the Confederate forces are um, forced to abandon Lookout Mountain and Missionary Ridge, those two ridges of, uh, around Chattanooga. They're, they, had to, they have to retreat. And General Grant takes Chattanooga and rescues Rosencrantz. Federal Bragg, the Confederate um, general, is, uh, is on, you know, basically on the retreat. And so Grant's army now moves in to invade Georgia. Remember Georgia? Uh, Chickamauga is in Georgia, and Chattanooga is in Tennessee. So now Grant, he has control. And so far, Grant, everything he's been doing has been... Um, turning out to be victorious, you know? So here's a picture of the Battle of Chattanooga. And you see here in the midst of all this what's going on, you know, so I kind of went over that. So I'll go over it again. Grant now gets to take command, not only of the West, Tennessee area and Georgia area and this area, but now um, his victories make him very popular in the North because the other um, generals, as you remember, went through a list of them, you know, um, from McDowell to McClellan, you know, to Meade, to Hooker, you know, to, um, um, well, anyway, there's a few others there that I already went over in the last video, but basically Lincoln, Lincoln President Lincoln happened to replace one general after another, and he's very discouraged. So, but they, he's looking at Grant like, Oh, you know, um, basically, um, Grant is, is not going to surrender. You know, unconditional surrender is his name, basically saying he's not going to, he's going to call for unconditional resender, um, surrender of the South. And so his military abilities are undeniable. So President Lincoln summons Grant to Washington, D.C. in March of 1864 and makes Ulysses S. Grant, General Grant, um, the head of the entire Union Army. And so he's the supreme commander of the armies of the Union. And Grant then plans a three-part attack, which was what they were been doing anyway. But this attack's gonna go on to 1864. First, and then he's going to take General Meade, even though Jenny Meade kind of flubbed up at Gettysburg and did not, um, oh, flubbed up and did not pursue Lee. He's now gonna take General Meade to continue to hammer against Lee in Richmond, Virginia. They still haven't got Richmond. Remember, that's the capital of the Confederate um, nation. The whole Confederate army is hang, hanging out there with General Lee in Richmond. So General Meade is to hammer against General Lee. And Union forces are to push east from Chattanooga to crush the Confederacy. So they're in Chattanooga, Tennessee now. He's going to appoint General Sherman there to crush the Confederacy and march to the sea. Um, and indeed, General Sherman does that, but he does it in an outlandish manner. Let's just say that, you know, um, something not to be proud of, of the North, the way they treated um, civilians in the midst of all this. But anyway, we'll talk about that in a bit. And the land and naval forces then are to attack at Mobile, Alabama. We'll find out that um, Admiral Farragut at Mobile, Alabama, um, comes in and attacks at, to capture Alabama, and which would be captured in August. 
you know, I think we went over that once too. So his three prongs, actually, that part, his three-part attack um, against Richmond, of course, and then on to the coast from Chattanooga from the west all the way to go through Georgia and then up into um, the Carolinas to march towards the sea and on up to the north. And then, of course, um, the naval battles at Mobile, uh, Mobile, Alabama, and that would be the last stronghold of the Confederacy in um, the midst of um, the naval attack, right? So here's a picture, it's a good picture of Grant. He always had a cigar in his mouth. <laughs> so, and he takes command at this point. Sherman's marches on Atlanta, Georgia. So remember, Grant now has taken over um, in Tennessee onto Georgia, and now going on to Georgia's um, capital, which is Atlanta, Georgia. So he puts, Grant puts General William Tecumseh Sherman, here's a picture of him in charge um, of the West. He lived 1820 to 1891, there's Sherman. So um, in May of 1864, Sherman and his troops start to push from Chattanooga, remember, Grant had taken Ch uh, Chattanooga into Georgia, um, with the major objective to take Atlanta, Georgia, to take the capital. So um, Confederate General Joseph E. Johnston, um, with a much smaller army, tries to stop Sherman in advance, but he's pushed back. So the Confederate President Jefferson Davis replaces Johnston with General John B. Hood. It's the first time you see a Confederate re um, replacement of a general, but he replaces them knowing that this is like the last resort. Sherman's marching into Atlanta, Georgia, the city, a, a Confederate city, a Southern city. And Hood though, uh, General John B. Hood, the Confederate um, general, makes a very grave mistake and defeat, and he takes refuge in Atlanta. But on September 1864, General Sherman, remember the Northern general there, takes possession of Atlanta and makes the Confederate troops abandon the city. He practically burns the city down. Let's just say that. He goes into Atlanta, burning the city, doing havoc to the city. And that's what um, General Sherman is noted for. He's noted for everything that he comes in contact gets looted or burned down or killed. He's a um, total... His idea was to total, totally devastate the people of the South. In fact, he says, my aim then was to whip the rebels, to humble their pride, to follow them to their innermost recesses and to make them fear and dread us. Fear is the beginning of wisdom. He misquotes the Bible, <laughs> right? It's the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, not the fear of him. But anyway, he is not a good guy, I just say. He's not my favorite general, that's for sure. So, and the General Sherman also says, war, war is cruelty. There is no use trying to reform it. The crueler it is, the sooner it will be over. So his idea was to make war cruel and to be cruel to the people, to make them fear and surrender. So his his ideas, especially when he's dealing with civilians, um, women and children, and uh, people that uh, have are in fear already of losing um, everything, losing their homes, and he does basically goes goes through and takes everything and burns everything down. And so he marches on Atlanta, Georgia first. Sherman's march to the sea. Now he's marching to the sea. You see some pictures here? Here's from Atlanta, Georgia. He's going to go to Savannah, Georgia. March this long march to the sea with all these different regiments here. So Sherman's move, um, now he's the Union general, um, was to strike the Confederate psychologically. So he wants to make, to strike them to the point that they're going to fear that they're not going to retaliate. So in November, he um, abandons his communication and his supply lines. He says, I'm not even gonna communicate with anyone, but we're gonna get, I'm gonna get her done. I'm gonna get this job done without even telling, you know, Abraham Lincoln, the president, exactly what he's doing, but he knows that he was, he was told to do this and he's gonna do it. 
um, to, the, to his liking too. Let's see. So he marched to the sea across the heart of Georgia and Savannah onto the Atlantic Ocean. This is his march. The troops, um, were demo uh, the troops were to demoralize the citizens, which they did. The troops took, he said, you could take whatever you want and destroy everything else. So they went into people's homes and everything and they took what they had. You know, in the wealthy plantations, they burned the plantations. They took, um, they took what, if they want anything, they took everything. They treated the people very poorly, pillaging mostly. I'm not saying all of them did that. A lot of the, the, the Union soldiers didn't, but there was a, definitely a great many that basically were taught to, be, to are told, I said, to devastate everything. So Sherman cut a swath of destruction 60 miles wide and 300 miles long, all the way to Savannah. It was 60 miles, and he burned this total area, burned everything in sight, anything, and took anything he, they wanted. And the Southerners indeed felt demoralized at this point. I mean, couldn't they have done it a different way? I mean, uh, even today, I'm sure a lot of these people that lost everything can look back in their history and see what devastation was done by the Union of Sherman's um, March to the Sea. Sherman attacks Savannah, Georgia. So now they're at the coast, Savannah's on the coast. The Southerners were demoralized. The Confederate troops also began to pillage the Georgians over and over. And the Sherman's troops, as they went, they became more devastating and Sherman's troops were to destroy anything that may give a military advantage. And in many cases, this resorted to looting, looting and pillaging, right? On December of 1864, Sherman attacked Savannah, Georgia. And Savannah surrendered on December 21st before Christmas in 1864. And so General Sherman, he finally sends word to President Abraham Lincoln. And he says, I beg to present you as a Christmas gift, the city of Savannah with 150 guns and ammo and 25,000 bales of cotton. So he's basically saying, we've overcome Atlanta and now we've overcome Savannah, Georgia, and Georgia is ours. But the devastation was horrific. Then Sherman starts to march north. We can see here, here's his, his uh, 60 mile um, wide march to the sea to Savannah. Now he takes up for Savannah and he's gonna go up to Columbia. He's gonna go through Charleston. This is Columbia, North Carolina. So he's gonna go through South Carolina and up through Columbia, North Carolina. So Sherman cut off railroad supplies and hurt the South badly, destroying the railroads. Basically, in January of 1865, Sherman turned north to help Grant crush the Confederacy, and he, his march left a path of destruction through the Carolinas that was even more devastating than in Georgia. It was even a worse devastation. <laughs> How could that be? But Columbia, the capital of South Carolina, fell to Sherman in February. So South Carolina now has fallen South Carolina, where the Confederate, uh, co Confederate um, state withdrew, um, was the first state to withdraw the Union, now fell to General Sherman. Then it led to the fall of Charleston, the big port of Charleston, the famous port of Charleston, um, South Carolina, falls to Sherman. And Sherman presses on through North Carolina, and he'll come to Columbia, do devastation to Columbia. Here's a bad picture of him. Basically, he was looting and pillaging along the way. Sherman's march to the sea and the burning of Columbia, South Carolina from its memoirs. So his idea was to burn the city so it could not even be a city again from the memoirs. That's what he wanted to do. Basically, burn down Charleston, burn down uh, uh, Columbia, Burned down, burned, yeah, burned down Savannah, Georgia, burned down Atlanta. All of these cities became devastation points, horrific points of abuse in the midst of a war, the war times, General Sherman, um, burning them into oblivion is what he wanted to do.
It's a pretty sad part in the Civil War, really. Now let's go back north up to Grant's, Grant's Wilderness Campaign to Richmond. Well, in May of 1864, now we're coming towards the end of the war, right? While Sherman began his march on Atlanta, Grant and his Potomac, remember Potomac River is right up there by Washington, um, D.C. Um, Grant and his Potomac Army headed south to attack Richmond, Virginia again, again, again. Grant pushes right through the wooded area of uh, Rappahannock. And Rappahannock, basically that area is so wooded, you can't get through it. The trees are so thick, and especially during this time. So he calls it the Wilderness Campaign because it's going through the wilderness, which he felt that General Lee would not even think he'd ever do is going through that wilderness. And he possibly should not have done it because General Lee's forces, they knew that woods inside and out. And so they used that terrain to their advantage in resisting Grant. And Grant reached, uh, Grant reached Richmond, but he lost how many men? Losing 55,000 men are a ridiculous amount of men. That is uh, horrific. So, so many Union soldiers died in the wilderness. They're trying to reach, reach Richmond, you know. But Grant still refused to give up. So, but on June 1864, Grant worked his way around Richmond to Petersburg, Petersburg and um, planned to attack from the south instead. Well, he began a nine-month siege against the Confederates at Petersburg. Nine months. Nine-month siege without supplies, without food at Petersburg. And so um, in April of 1865, both Petersburg and Richmond fell to the Union forces. So the capital of the Confederate now falls to the Union forces, but after a horrific loss of soldiers. Uh, um, basically, Grant losing 55,000 men. Oh my goodness, that is a humongous amount of loss, of, of death toll, huge death toll. Like I said, the Civil War's death, death toll is more than any other war in U.S. history. Surrender at Appomattox. So on Sunday, April 9th, remember that day, April 9th, 1865, General Ulysses S. Grant and General Robert E. Lee met at McLean House, a private house in the village of Appomattox, Appomattox Courthouse. So they met at this house and they were discussing the terms of surrender. Grant's terms, General Grant's terms were very generous. He was very lenient. Um, General Lee's troops were to be paroled and the officers were allowed to keep their arms even, their sidearms. And they could also take their horses and mules. And he promised them even 25,000 rations for any ill-fed troops. If the troops were hungry, he gave them food. And General Grant allowed General Lee to keep his sword, um, he said, basically, basically giving his sword and saying, here you go. General um, Grant um, had much respect for the for General the older generally um, Lee he respected him and in fact they both fought together when they fought in Mexico you know um, back at the, the war against the, the Mexican American War they fought together and so they discussed some of the old times together they shook hands and Lee accepted graciously he, um, he he came in polished as a polished general and he left as a polished general and Grant greatly res respected him. And both of them departed in dignity. Hmm. Just too bad that we have to lose so many men and go so, so through so much of this for this last moment, the end of the Civil War at, the, um, at Appomattox, the shaking of a handshake between two great generals two great American generals. So here's where they met at a house. The end of the conflict was over, but the war still was raging in some areas. It would take a couple more months to, um, to calm down, let's just say that. Lee's surrender virtually ended the war, but other Confederate surrenders happened over the next few months. In April 26, 
Confederate General Johnston surrendered to Sherman. So remember, um, Sherman is doing his terrible march. Well, um, basically the Confederate General surrendered to Sherman, says, no more marching, we've surrendered. And uh, President Jefferson Davis here uh, was captured in Georgia on May 1865. Here's kind of a picture where they captured his wife and captured him, this is kind of a weird picture, but um, they captured Jefferson Davis because he had, def he had um, retreated um, you know, into Georgia and so um, captured him and the other Confederates all gave up too. The last was uh, two, I should say two of the last, one was General, General Stand Wati and his Cherokee mounted rifles surrendered in June. Here he is right here, here they are. These are Indians, Native Americans that fought for the South. They were the last to surrender, of course, in the South. General Wati and his Cherokee mounted rifles, last to surrender. But the final surrender was um, actually military surrender. Surrender was a, a naval, uh, I should say, in 1865. The S, uh, CSS Shenandoah ship was the only Confederate ship um, to circumvent the globe. This Confederal sh Confederate ship surrendered in Great Britain. So it was actually the last surrender, but the last surrender on our um, continental United States was... Um, was the Indian surrender of um, General Standwati and his Cherokee mounted rifles? You know, so here's here's the surrender of the um, of the S uh, the Shenandoah. Shenandoah was the Confederate ship that surrendered. Now let's go over just really quick a couple of lives of the the generals, and these were Christian generals. Um, first of all, we're going to talk about George B. McClellan. He lived 1826 to 1885. He was a famous Northern general, as you know, and he had um, hard work and diligence very much, um, but he's most remembered for his defeats to General Lee, as General Lee, he had basically defeated him a couple of times. He graduated second class from West Point, in the, and he's also in the Mexican War, like many of them were. He worked as a chief engineer in the railroad, and later he ran for president against Lincoln. Can you believe that? Him and Lincoln were not always on good terms. In fact, Lincoln kept kept letting him go and would replacing him. So, um, well, um, in the, after the Civil War, war um, he uh, in the Civil War he returned to active duty in the Army of Potomac. Anyway, he fought in the first Battle of Bull Run, and he helped to restore the moral morality of the men. Um, in 1865, we went over running for president. He retired, serving one term as the governor of New Jersey. Most of his soldiers reverent him very much as a leader with a caring spirit and strong Christian faith. He said, war should be conducted upon the highest principles known to Christian civilization. So he did conduct war on high principles, not like General Sherman, right? That did the looting and stuff. Uh, McClellan would never have done that. And so he held to that firm belief that he had high standards. And of course, we have Robert E. Lee, 1807 to 1870. He said, in all my perplexities and distresses, the Bible has never failed to give me light and strength. He was definitely carried a Bible with him. He says, there are few, I believe, in this enlightened age who will not acknowledge that slavery as an institution is a moral and political evil. He was against slavery, but he fought for the South because he protected his beloved state of Virginia. So um, he left overseeing plantation to command the, federal sh the Confederate troops. Um, Lee's dedication to duty, he's remembered as a great American. At the Academy of West Point, he was a hero in the Mexican War, uh, too, like most of them were. He was a superintendent at West Point um, and lieutenant of Calvary, in the Calvary of Texas. Uh, President Lincoln actually offered Lee a, a command job, command as command, commanding the Union force, but Lee uh, denied that because he felt allegiance to his state of Virginia, so he declined the offer. Even though Lee opposed slavery and he also opposed succession, um, that he decided to fight for his state. 
Um, and he won remembrance as one of the greatest military leaders in all of his American history, a great military leader. I mean, basically the war would not have been fought as long if it hadn't been for General Robert E. Lee. And later on in his life, he became the president of a college, Washington College. So the last little bit I just wanna go over is on this character, Thomas Jonathan Jackson, Stonewall Jackson, who lived 1824 to 1863. He was one of the Confederates' greatest, greatest military assets, and he was a great leader. His, his soldiers loved him dearly. He was born in Clarksville, Virginia, which is now West Virginia, and um, he's, he didn't have much schooling. His schooling was very inconsistent, but he worked hard, so he received an opportunity to go to West Point, you know, to become a military leader. Um, he served with distinction also in the Mexican War, huh? like I said, most of them did. In 1851, he was appointed to the faculty of the Virginia Military Institute and served there 10 years, the Military Institute. Jackson also opposed slavery in succession, but he remained loyal to Virginia, just like Robert A. Lee. He was against slavery, and he didn't really want um, uh, the, to succeed from the Union, but he was loyal to his state of Virginia. And his military um, skill provided in, was invaluable to the South. Stonewall Jackson became his name. The first Battle of Bull Run, we went over, he stood his ground like a stone wall. So he became known as Stonewall Jackson. And he's especially known for his Christian influence. He was converted as to a Christian to Christianity in his military career, and he was an ardent Presbyterian. He promoted worship, prayer, and study of the scripture with his troops. He studied the Bible with his troops, prayed with them, and worshiped with them. He said the fear of the Lord he loved and served. This was the only fear he knew. He said the only fear I know is the fear of the Lord. But after the battle of Chancellorsville, he was accidentally shot by one of his own men when returning after dark because he was mistaken as the enemy and the doctors amputated his left arm to save his life, but he then developed pneumonia and died of pneumonia. Uh, Robert E. Lee, upon hearing of the amputation said, he has lost his left arm, but I have lost my right. Like he was his right armed man, right? Jackson's strong leadership and Christian morals make him greatly respected by all. So as you see here, there were Christians on both sides of the Civil War. And the sad thing was, you know, they were fighting and some of them did not even, you know, know exactly what they were fighting about, you know, but most of them were defending their own, um, their own life, they thought. So as well as Jackson and Robert A. Lee, they didn't even believe in slavery. Hmm. So, it would be so as we look at the Civil War and learn from it, you know, so in these times that we're living, you know, to learn, basically to learn what, what are we fighting, really fighting for, you know, and to, as turning, the, the, turning to the Lord, how important that is. Although all those young men were lost in the Civil War, right? But many of them, Many, many of them had come to know Jesus as their savior in revivals and with chaplains and such. And we're going to go over that too, Christianity, how it flourished in the midst of a war. So a sad time indeed, but you know, a lot of these young men and a lot of even the generals we're going to see in heaven someday. Hmm. You believe that?